Welcome back. Well, surges in demand for children's medicine have led to shortages in Canada that had spurred the feds to act by importing supply. But the problem of drug shortages may persist in the future if nothing changes, and they've been around in the past. Dr. Joel Lection is an emergency room physician and expert on pharmaceutical policy in Canada. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me. So why are drug shortages predictable in this country? In this case, a surge in demand that you could say perhaps was harder to see, but there are systemic issues that make shortages happen here. What underlies those? Well, first of all, we have to realize that it's not just Canada that has shortages. The U.S. has them, the U.K. has them, Australia has them, most Western European countries have them. So we're not unique in that respect. Um, why we're having shortages, though, seems to be a relatively common a, a common reason, which is that most Western countries have offshored the supply of the active pharmaceutical ingredient. That's the part of the drug that does the job. And 80% of those are made in India or China. And if something goes wrong with factories there and there's less um, inspection done in those places, then we suffer the consequences. This came up uh, during the pandemic in terms of having our own ability to manufacture vaccines. A bit of a change in thinking from outsource everything to let's keep some things closer to home. Do you expect us to move further in the direction of being able to manufacture these compounds here? And then who decides what's on that list of what we can actually make ourselves? So I would certainly hope that we um, move to more domestic supply. Uh, but as to what should be on that list, what we need to do first is identify critical medications. In other words, drugs that are essential for preserving life or um, bodily functions. So these may be particular antibiotics, anesthetic agents, cardiac medications, a variety of those. And then once we have identified those drugs, we look at which ones are only being made by single companies um, and supplied in Canada so that we know which ones have a greater chance of going into short supply if something happens like a fire in a factory somewhere. Once we've done all that, then the job is to make provisions to try and prevent shortages. So require companies to have a six month stock of medication of those critical medications mm -hmm. um, set up better um, arrangements for um, shifting drugs across Canada. We have no arrangements for that now. So something is in short supply or more short supply in, in Ontario but there's a better supply in Vancouver, British Columbia. Right. There's no way of shifting those drugs back and forth. Not a ton of time here, Dr. Lexion, but one of the reasons you can rhyme off that roadmap is that you and others have been studying this and producing those kinds of strategies for a little while now. Uh, what progress are you seeing on any implementation to solve these problems? Um, not a lot. The federal government has a list of critical drugs, but I think that's only about a dozen. There are certainly more than a dozen. Um, and what happened with the government, um, with Health Canada's response to the shortage of liquid Tylenol and Advil um, leaves a lot to be desired. That shortage has been going on for about eight months now, and only now does the government seem to be acting. To have you with us. Appreciate your time today. Thank you. Joel Lection is an emergency room physician and an expert on pharmaceutical policy issues in Canada. Well, of course, one of the big pressing issues in this country is a shortage of doctors. They may be retiring in droves, but it seems that it was also cuts in the early 1990s that set the stage for a shortage of physicians today. How do we get more of them trained and fast? Alika Lafontaine is president of the Canadian Medical Association. Thank you for being with us. Thanks for having me. So this doctor shortage, of course, is not uh, news, and many Canadians do experience this in a really dramatic and drastic way, which is they can't get a doctor. Uh, worst case scenario, mm -hmm. uh, we can all agree, in a country like this one. The shortage, though, as I understand it, really does go back to the cuts of the 90s. Uh, we, so we reduced the number of uh, spots in medical schools. It was kind of a slow-moving problem. Why haven't we done better at making sure we have enough supply for the population we've got? 
So I, I think a big problem with the solutions that will actually solve this problem definitively is that we still maintain the structures that we had in place years ago when patients access care very, very differently. You know, in the early 90s, people were still just accessing care in their local areas. We've now moved into places where people access care across their province or sometimes even across the country. And our training systems haven't kept up. You know, over the past two or three years, there's also been a spike in demand. And patients are coming in often with problems that are, are more emergent than they would be otherwise because of delays in care. You know, hundreds of thousands of surgeries that have been delayed across the country, millions of health services. And so all those things have led to increased demand without an increase in the supply of doctors. So it, obviously it takes time to train a doctor. Uh, there's a lot of talk about credentials, about um, bringing doctors in from other countries, and even the credentials to cross borders in this country, which can be uh, a bit difficult for uh, for practitioners of health care. Are, are you seeing any big movement on that front? Are we able to import doctors who are trained in other countries and actually treat their medical degrees like they matter? So I think we definitely are asking different questions in this cycle of healthcare shortages. So we, we had shortages of doctors in the late 90s and the early 2000s. You know, we were obviously going through that cycle again this time around. You know, the, the access to care that patients currently have is probably some of the worst that I've ever seen and that colleagues have told me that they've ever seen. Waiting almost the entire day to be seen in an emergency room because you can't see your family doctor, going to a walk-in clinic, having the same sort of experience, repeating it the next day because you have to get home and take care of your kids or mm -hmm. other things things in your life. You know, it's, it's an untenable situation. Things that would improvement, improve things are increasing mobility of providers across the country. So we can actually go to places where patients need care, you know, simplifying those processes. And I think there is some good work happening in that way. The other part, like you mentioned, is internationally educated health professionals, and those include physicians. Streamlining those processes and making sure that it's predictable for folks coming in and out of country. But I, I think one thing that we really need to focus on is stabilizing the state of primary care in this country. We need to provide support to people who provide primary care, family physicians in particular, to make sure that the places that they work and the work that they provide is valued in the right sort of way and that they aren't overloaded the way that they have been over the past few years. We can't ignore the fact that this problem, which is hitting uh, all Canadians of every strata because we have this universal system, does though hurt the most vulnerable uh, even more. There's a, a disproportionate and inequitable effect on our most vulnerable populations. Just characterize how serious that is and can we make that enough of a crisis to start there with solutions? You know, I, I think when you look at uh, areas that previously had poor access, so I, I live and work in Grand Prairie, Alberta. It's a small town in northern Alberta of about 70,000 people. You know, we were experiencing shortages of health professionals far earlier than our larger centers in Alberta, like Calgary and Edmonton. And so the small centers and the areas where care is already limited experienced these shortages long before. And what I think that shows us is that we know the factors that actually go into shortages. We know how to track whether or not folks can provide the, the care that people need. But what we need to do is start to lean into these solutions nationally, where we start to do it in a collaborative way. You know, things like Pan-Canadian licensure, we've talked lots about national health human resource strategies. You know, we've never needed that data and information and collaboration more than we need today. And we really call on our leaders and decision makers across the country to get to work solving this problem for Canadians. So good to have your time today. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Dr. Lika LaFontaine is president of the Canadian Medical Association. Coming up, making healthcare better might depend on seeing it more clearly. The importance of information next. But first, this. As long as we're talking about shortages of medicine in Canada, it would be a shame not to point out the obvious solution. Pay hundreds of dollars for something that normally costs a few bucks. That, at least, was Amazon's response to the problem with resellers offering bottles of children's Advil for almost $300. We're all for a free market, but this just feels unhealthy. We're back after this.